Welcome to Soul Adventure TV, where we explore what may very well be an unprecedented opportunity in humanity's spiritual and physical evolution, and the choices standing before each and every individual to walk on this grand adventure or not. Do we really know who and what we are and what we can choose to be? I'm your host and fellow soul adventurer, Steve Crow. James Gilliland is an internationally known speaker, author, and contactee. He is the founder of the Self Mastery Earth Institute, Science, Spirit, and World Transformation Conferences, as well as the East SETI Ranch, which is an internationally known UFO and paranormal hotspot. He is the author of several books, including Reunion with Source, Becoming Gods, and his latest book, The Ultimate Soul Journey. James has dedicated his life in service to the awakening and healing of humanity and Earth. After a near-death experience, he left his material life in commercial real estate and began a 34-year spiritual journey, which included the study of most religions, the TIC teachings of the Inner Christ, the Tibetan Foundation, and more. So at this time, it's with great pleasure that I welcome to Soul Adventure TV, our guest, James Gilliland. Hey, James. Great, Great to be on the show again. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on. I wanted to get right into one of the, I think it's one of the earlier books that, you, that you've written that I became aware of, and that is the Becoming Gods and Becoming Gods 2. And I wanted to ask you, when you say gods, what exactly do you mean, and, and how do you contrast that with the God or the source? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. The best way I can explain that is, is if you go back to the teachings of Jesus or any other masters, you know, his prayer was let them become one as we have become one. And uh, it's actually merging with the one consciousness that encompasses all consciousness and all planes and dimensions throughout the multiverse. So it's a matter of... of of going within and realizing that you're actually a multidimensional being. You're not just a, a body and a personality, but you're a spirit that has a body and a personality. And that spirit has many, many levels to it all the way back to the source. So it's just a, a state of expanded awareness where you, you go within and, you know, just like Jesus said, the temple is within all the other masters say, go within. Uh, the whole universe is within, is what Buddha talks about. And it's a matter of going within and becoming one, you know, with that one consciousness. That's very interesting. You know, um, we, uh, on this program, we focus a lot on what some people call the ascension or the shift. And I was wondering what your perspective on life might be like uh, after this event or this process occurs. You know, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, we are going to have some major challenges between now and then. And the entire Earth is moving into a new level, you might say, or it's it's going through a frequency change. So we, if we're going to stay on Earth, we have to match that frequency. As she ascends, we have to go with her. Uh, some people won't make the journey. They'll, they'll check out and start over somewhere else, or they'll finish the process on the next level, depending on their consciousness. But... It's uh, what I see, uh, I, from what I understand from all the prophecies, all the research I've done, and my own inner guidance, is that when we get on the other side of this critical mass or this big shift, uh, things start healing very fast, very rapidly. Uh, people are less dense physical. You have more control over your body, over your health, over your well-being. Uh, the, the earth starts healing very fast and, and the, the higher the star nations, the higher beings come in and start utilizing their technologies to help the earth heal very quickly and very gracefully. It's going to heal just as fast. So a lot of the years of destruction and pollution and everything else that we've done is going to be cleaned up uh, much quicker than people can imagine. Do you foresee that, the, uh, that there will be for lack of a better word, an old earth left behind as the new earth rises in vibration? You know what? I understand I, in the back in the 70s when I was in deep meditation, Baba G was coming to me and he told me that there would be a, a bifurcation you know, process where there would be two earths. And, and I didn't understand it at the time. And I just said, you know, that doesn't make sense. How can there be two earths? But when I started looking at the mini world concept and, and the, the, the other dimensions and how 
one could go through a shift and how you can bilocate and be in two places at once. And I started getting all these understandings under my belt. I realized that 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 is a possibility. And and in a lot of the classes that we teach here, the Yigong classes and things of that nature, the self-mastery classes, I actually watch people vanish and disappear. <laughs> and and uh, you can see the chair. You can see right through them and you can see the chair and then they just disappear and then come back. And so I have a lot of masters that come here from, from the East that are teachers and and uh, we've been having that happen here on a regular basis where people are actually phasing out and going from one one world to the other, you might say. Wow, that, that's tremendous. Um, as a teacher, uh, where do you see humanity being at in its current evolutionary push? I mean, you know, we know that we're challenged. We have to raise our vibration if we want to make this transition. So I'm just mm -hmm. basically asking, well, how are we doing? Boy, uh, that's a tough one. I think, you know, a lot of people say, uh, they talk about, you know, what's going to happen in my future? And I said, well, there's as many futures as there are people here because we're all making choices day by day. And some people have chosen, chosen to totally ignore what's going on and just hang out in mainstream social consciousness and you know and they you know they they work in cubicles and they they get on the subway or drive home and go to another cubicle and turn on the tv and go back to the other cubicle you know <laughs> and that's basically their life or they go into a room and plug in their computer although the internet has amazing things on it like this show you know but uh, you. <laughs> the the uh you know it's most of them are, are more focused on the more base things you know survival sex and power is what's programmed into mainstream consciousness and and they're not getting into the heart or con contemplating the higher consciousness and energy and most of those people will be kind of caught unaware they're they're they've chosen you know not to participate in this they've chosen not to shift and and to, to you know live a life that's loving joyous and service oriented and and things of that nature so so they, I think those groups, a lot of those groups are going to have some real hard lessons, you know, to shake them out of their comfort zones. And then there's other people that are kind of in the middle. They know something's going on. They feel it. They go, something's happening. I'm not sure what it is. And, and those people are starting to reach out and they're starting to, to play catch up. You know, they're trying to, to play catch up right now. And then there's other people that have been aware of this since birth basically and and they know what's happening they came in to be a part of it and they're the ground crew and they're really helping you know with this process and they're they're paying attention and they're going with the flow and they're going to be fine because they have their own inner guidance they have their own personal god creator connection whatever you want to call it and uh and they're being you know they're doing the the meditation time or the calm time and they're they're in nature a lot so so they're more aware of, of what's of what's happening. So I just see when when the one world collapses and it will, uh, it can't. It's unsustainable. Uh, we we need to start focusing on on another world. You know, the new world coming in, and and it won't be the new world order. Those guys are pretty much collapsing in on themselves already. There will be a new world coming, but uh, the the new world order is in total disorder right now. And and it's we call them the powers that were, <laughs> you know they're yeah. they're totally collapsing in on themselves right now. Well, in terms of of timing, I I don't know. Uh, are you uh, one of those who uh, believes in the December twenty twelve date, or what is what is your sense of the timing of these events? It's really interesting. I think that's one of the major critical mass points. Where, where a shift happens. I know it's when we're in full alignment, when the sun comes into full alignment with galactic plane, which is going to be a real doozy. The earth is already in it right now, but when the earth comes into alignment, I mean, when the sun comes into alignment with galactic plane, uh, that, you know, the sun's already reacting to it. We just got hit with an X class flare, which we're experiencing, you know, <clears throat> as we speak, we're experiencing the, the remnants of that. But uh, we had something like 18 or 19 M-class flares in a row and then now two S-class flares. So the, the sun is reacting to this shift and we're moving into a highly energized place in space. 
So uh, this is physics. You know, this isn't prophecy anymore. This is this is uh, statistics. But uh, you know, we are seeing an increase in earthquake and volcanic activity, severe weather. Uh, all these things are happening right now. We're in we're in the middle of it, and I think the apex of that hits you know right around the twenty first. So I don't I don't think it's going to be an exact date, and then everybody kind of holds hands and sings kumbaya and it ends. You know, I don't think that's the way it's going. Well, to there happen. goes my plans. I <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah I might be trying that one, but I'm not sure. You know, but uh, the uh, I I just think it's individual. Uh, people are going to go when when you know they've chosen to go you know they have their own contracts and their own agreements that they came to fulfill and i think some people totally chose to to shift this and ride the planet through and and help as take as many people as they can with them and other people chose not to hmm. you know they chose chose just to come down and work a few things out and and that's that's all they chose to come here and do you know, I, I heard you on another interview talk about, uh, speaking of cosmic events, a cosmic light wave coming at us from the center of our galaxy. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask you in more detail about what the source of this light is. Uh, is it starlight? Is it coming from a black hole? Or what, what is your sense of what is this light made of? Is it just ordinary light? Well, there's, there's so many things going on. There are so many sources that are coming in um i think it's susan renton uh oh god i'm trying to think of her name I'll, it'll come to me but she's an astrophysicist and uh, she talks a lot about this and she said the earth is getting hit with over 500 hits a day of cosmic energies coming in gamma rays x-rays uh we're just getting totally bombarded right now uh, there's a crazy susan joy renison is her name uh. but uh yeah but there's a um a uh, huge looks like a, a serpent energy going around the planet at the equator right now and nasa doesn't even know what this is uh and it's cutting off the gps's and a lot of having a lot of trouble with the satellites because of this uh the rattlesnake prophecies of the cherokee talk about this huge serpent rope or energy that's moving out and it goes through the plays pleiades the orion council or the orion system and then spins around and comes back in and hits earth so uh, we are getting hit by so many different things and, and also these huge magnetic waves, waves that were coming into alignment with galactic core or uh, galactic plane. Everybody has a different name for it. So it's a combination of things that are going on and each one of them is just a huge influx of energy. And, and you know, if you, if you study semantics, you know, whenever a big burst of energy comes into the planet, everything has to adapt and change and match that frequency or... or find equilibrium yeah so. speaking of that i think you met, have mentioned in that prior interview that the uh, the effect of that uh, massive energy wave upon the human body would be one of yes. transmutation and i was wondering if you could go into that a, in a little bit more detail well on a on a physical level our dna lines all have an attribute and if you look at the dna of lamas and yogis that have engaged in a lot of spiritual practices you know, they've gone through DNA changes. It's actually measurable. And the sun itself is actually altering our DNA. And when these lines op open up, one of the lines is telepathy. You know, another line when it gets activated is the ability to see forward or backward in time. You know, and there's another line that activates where you can do, you know, bilocation and teleportation and things like that. Uh, another DNA line is the salamander gene where you can actually regrow a new arm, you know, and you can... It's an incredible healing ability that, and and this you know the scientists used to call this junk DNA, and now they're finding out it's not junk. It's just not activated, but all of that's being activated, and uh, right now, so that's one level. And when these waves hit us, it affects our bioelectric fields around the body. Okay, some people will get really tired and lethargic, and they'll be achy everywhere, you know, and and just want to sleep. Other people get really excited by it, and uh, you know they might have emotional outbursts or, or old wounds and traumas will surface, you know, for them to deal with. And uh, everybody's different, and it's a waveform. So if you have a high and a low. You get really high with it, and then you have a crash. You know, <clears throat> you get really low as you're processing, but eventually you'll find equilibrium in that. You know, as we go through this process. 
but uh, uh, it's it's very interesting the way people are reacting. You can see these solar flares are tied directly into social, economic, and physical earth changes, and and uh, and that's a new science that actually I was talking about in 1982. You know, and everybody mm. laughed at it and said I was crazy. But you know, I was talking about the Andromedans and the triangle ships and everything else back then too. So, and now they're here. Yeah. Uh- you know, you, you gave us a beautiful description of, of what we are in terms of, uh, as contrasted with our physical bodies, what we are in essence. And I'd like to explore that uh, in a little bit more detail. The teachings that I've been exposed to say that our true selves are kind of like sparks from a much larger flame of mm-hmm. cosmic divine energy called God. Yes. But I've also heard that our soul, in order to incarnate here on Earth in 3D reality, actually has to further subdivide itself, and only a sliver of our true self, our true, I don't know, oversoul, if you will, travels with mm-hmm. us here. And then when you add in parallel realities, multi-universes, and so on, the question <laughs> that I want to ask is, how many versions of James are there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? I always ask that myself. Uh, I tell you, I went through a... a a real shakeup in a way. Uh, it was kind of a struggle because when I was uh, going through the the dimensions, you know, I connected with my soul, and uh, and you know, connected with this being. And you're saying I'm your soul, you know. And I said, okay, well, I'm just uh, you know, an incarnation of this soul. You know, he decided to come down here and project his energy down here into a new body. You know, so I was fine with that. And then another being showed up, you know, and, and he says, you know, I'm your, your Christ self, you might say, or on another dimension. And so he shows up and, you know, his name's Tosamara. And uh, so I said, oh, oh, great, you know, and so I'm, I'm kind of going through an identity crisis here, you know, <laughs> because this guy's saying, so I, could, I accepted that. Okay, you know, maybe I'm an aspect of this soul that, that sent him sent down here to the earth. And then... Uh, you know, I went up and I connected with Kazekiel, this other being that's on the seventh dimensional being, this fully realized God being. And he's saying, you're my hands and feet, you know. So so I'm having a total identity crisis with all these experiences saying, what is going on here? You know, uh, who am I? What's this all about? And then Kazekiel told me, it's all you. <laughs> you know. And so I did the wraparound where I realized that identity isn't even important anymore. And, and that when you merge with the source, you know, the one consciousness that encompasses all consciousness, like, like the teachings of Buddha, you know, the whole universe is within. So each one of those little slivers, you might say, is a hologram. It's a fractal of the whole. And that spark can reignite and become the full flame if, if we do our practices, you know. But we can't just say we are. We have to, you know, it's something we have to. I, I always say there's a knowing and then there's a believing, and then there's a realizing, you know, so <laughs> that's so why we can know it, yes. and then we can believe in it, but that's still not enough, and you have to totally realize it, and, and then you own it. A source I trust says, uh, thinking is not knowing, knowing is knowing, thinking is just your mind, you know, going, Yeah. but, but to know yeah. is something quite, quite different. Uh, exactly. On a, on a karmic level, how many of these soul versions do you think we're, we're directly responsible for? You know, are those other versions of ourselves, if we think about different timelines or parallel realities, uh, yeah. you know, are we responsible for those or are we only responsible for this focus? Um, I see the word responsible as just the ability to respond. Mm. And, and so I don't see it as a burden or anything else. But uh, I know I had to pick up one of my past lives, which was, was this Viking warrior, you know, and he had a big broad and and would lay to waste whole villages and so he had this incredible fearlessness and courage and everything else but it was created from an experience where his whole family was killed and uh and so there's a lot of rage and anger that created that reality so i actually had to pick that up and i had to bring the courage back but clear up the wounds and the traumas and things like that and bring it all back into oneness so, so it's interesting. I, I just say we're responsible for what's in front of us and, uh, and, and how we respond to what's in front of us is, is individual. You know, one person can respond as a victim, you know, another one will respond to it as a God, you know. So it just depends on what level you're going to respond to these experiences. But if you keep seeing the one and everything and you hold that unity consciousness, 
and focus on love and joy and bliss, that's the ultimate power in the universe. That's the source itself. And if you channel that into these situations, you're the one in control, basically. Yeah, you know, I, I had an interesting conversation uh, with someone. I can't remember who it who it was, or perhaps it was something that I read. But it had to do with the formation or how parallel universes or, or new timelines are created. And basically what this person was saying was that uh, anytime we make a choice, uh, the choices that we don't make are uh, actually create a different uh, timeline uh-huh. where, the, where those get played out. Is, does that resonate with your experiences or do you have a different viewpoint on how and when uh, parallel realities or timelines are created? Well, that's a tough one. That's kind of down in the psychic level, it seems like. Mm. Um, but the uh, it seems to me that that every choice you make sets a journey, sets a, a momentum, whatever you want to call it, a forward momentum. And so I think the choices you don't make were just possibilities, and and they they probably just come to a dead end. You know, if you once you make a choice and you go off in this journey, those other ones are probably just like a a dead end. That would be my my version of it. But you know, I'm I'm not infallible. <laughs> you know, it's so I'm so. How sure. how do you see how did these uh, if they do indeed exist these parallel realities or multiple timelines? How did they come come about? If it's not from our choices, then you know what's going on. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think I think these timelines. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard to wrap your head around this because when you get into the higher levels, there is no time. Exactly you know, you, right. <laughs> yeah, you can go forward or backward anywhere along it, along the wheel, you might say, and and so on that level, that's kind of where my head's at, where where there is no time, and I can go back and forth and clear these things and and work on on those levels. Mm. I don't think we're locked into any timeline uh, here other than what we agree to or what we believe. Uh, but there is a lot of momentum, you know, when you have 7 billion people, you know, if you have 7 billion lemmings going off a cliff and you're you're the guy in the flow, you know, trying to go against the flow, it's uh, you may go off the cliff with them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not that easy to overcome that amount. But I love that. I love the saying one on the side of God is the majority, you know, so... You know, you can reach up and and get some help and bring that into the equation and totally change that that reality. You know, so I, I it's kind of interesting looking at that. Uh, a good example is is that when I was in Santa Cruz, California, I had all these visions, and a lot of them happened. You know, including the the big earthquake down there and things like that. And uh, and I was trying to tell people about. Look, we have to get busy we have to start getting groups and get help and and so a lot of people had visions of san francisco just getting obliterated you know completely mm-hmm. so many psychics saw that and that was what was on the books that that was on the books to happen and i think enough people got together and i also saw some andromedan ships that that appeared that flew down the fault line we're sending a green beam of energy into the fault line which is another divine intervention program so a combination of the people asking and other people hearing and doing their part and all these interactions can, can always change, you know, these realities or, or actually postpone them, you might say. So it's, it's yeah, it's tricky, you know, to, to, you know, they weren't wrong. You know, the people that were seeing that weren't wrong. They saw a timeline or a possibility that was probably in, you know, in the 70 or 80 percent realm. And, uh, and, you know, they took it down to where it didn't happen, you know, at all. James, you've talked about three universal principles. The first one being love God with all your heart. The second one, honor each individual as a unique expression of God. And finally, behave as if the God in all life matters. And can you talk a little bit about each point and, and how these perhaps how these uh, uh, points were delivered to you because mm-hmm. they're uh, they're moving they're quite they're quite uh... yeah yeah to me you know I always tell people when I say love God with all your heart I'm not talking about a little old man with a beard you know up in the heavens that's man's image you know and and you know there's over 11,000 offshoots of Christianity out there 
you know, and each has the same Bible and images, and, and then you have all these other religions. It's just crazy how many there are. Uh, but, you know, we have to go and ask who created that. You know, well, you know, whenever you have a name or an image or, or you know, you've got a creation there. So you have to say, where'd that come from? And I always tell people, you know, if a little old man appears with you a beer and says, I'm God, just say, I want to talk to your mom. <laughs> you, know, so, uh, you know, you know, and uh, and so it's it's kind of interesting because we we all think that it's always masculine and it's always. Uh, but, you know, you take it back to the, the formless state and and I just see the source as the wellspring from which all life came forth. And, and that's my image of it. It's, it's more of a consciousness and an energy. And uh, it's not, and even it has two aspects to it. It's, it's, the, it's, it's nothing and everything at the same time, which is hard for people to wrap their heads around. So, uh, but, but we need to get a new image of, of God, you know, and let go of the old wrathful God images. That, that, that was a historical thing that happened in the past that I wrote about. And it wasn't God that was pulling all those stunts, you know, in the Old Testament. It was another being. But, uh, you know, that's it. With Christianity, they're, they're split because they have this jealous, wrathful God that's, uh, um, that's, that's basically a genocidal maniac, you know, destroying village after village and bashing kids' heads out on rocks and, and killing all the animals and everything else. And, and then on the, in the New Testament, you have this all-loving, all-forgiving God, you know, which, which I would rather hang out with that guy, you know. But uh, you have to ask, well, who created them and take it one step further. But, uh, and so it's really important to get an image of God. I focus on just that love and joy and bliss and, and focus on those energies. Uh, one of the Tibetan lamas I studied with, he said that, there's so few Christed beings or enlightened beings on the planet because it's so damn simple. And he said, you focus on love and joy and bliss until you become it. And he goes, that you're closest to the source when you're in bliss. But, uh, and that's a really simple teaching, a very powerful one. But that's the first part, you know, if, if you're going to love God, it'd be a good idea to, to know who, what God is and that, and that kind of get a little bigger image of it. Uh, and then, uh, See, what was it? Love God with all your heart. Uh, honor each individual. Honor each individual is a unique expression of God. So, so that goes back to uh, the big cosmic joke: is you can't separate yourself from omnipresence. You know? <laughs> and you know, you can be a body and a personality and think you're separate, but you're not. You're still in the field of unity, that unique, uh, unified field. You're still part of that, and and which is the source. So if God is omnipresent, how do you separate separate yourself from God? And if you see the God in everyone and, and behave accordingly, then we'll have peace. You know, we'll have abundance. We'll have all these wonderful things coming in. It wants to remember who we are and that the creator is omnipresent within all creation. So that was another another powerful premise that was given to me. And then and then again, seeing the creator in all creation, again, all creation is is not separate from omnipresence either. Because uh, I know people try to separate the rock and the tree and, you know, the plants, everything, you know, from from nature. They go, no, that's created. You know, you can't. That's created. We can do whatever we want with it. And uh, and that's one of the problems we're having on the planet right now because uh, we aren't acting respectfully in nature. You know, we aren't just taking what we need and uh, maintaining the, the balance, you know, and things like that. We're just totally raping the oceans the forests and and polluting them and everything else because we've we've dishonored that that concept you know of of you know honoring creation too it's mm -hmm. it's all again it's omnipresent the creator is omnipresent within all creation so you know it's a good way of being in denial you know and good way to to rape and pillage the planet and make a lot of money you know and be totally greedy but uh, to separate the two and that's why the separation is so strong uh, you know, because uh, people benefit from it, and they're going to choose a belief that benefits them. Yeah, I, I particularly resonate to the to the second point because it reminds me of another saying that I heard, which was, uh, um, you know, you can't uh, you can't hold yourself in the light while you insist that your brother and sister remain in darkness. You know that we're all. <laughs> We're all part of the of, of, of that unity that you spoke of, and yeah. and and once you accept that there's divine 
um, love and divine creation in each and every thing and every one, it sure makes it harder to take advantage and, you know, molest them and destroy them once you wrap your head around that because you're, in essence, doing it to yourself, <laughs> for one yeah. thing, you know. And, and what's unfortunate is we do have a society based on competition and separation and and it goes all the way up to the top and the further you go up the food chain, the more separate things are, the more they do the division program. And it's very, it's sad, you know, because, you know, and that's the problem we have. We have the, you know, the 1%, you know, doing their thing and we have their minions down below, you know, doing their program. But again, uh, you know, one of the masters, I love what he said. He said, now you, you may not believe in love and joy and bliss and unity consciousness. He goes, but that might not be their truth, you know. And they're not operating from that, that same. So you have, to, you have to realize that. Just say, look, you know, you hold your own focus, but at the same time you have to realize there are people out there that are operating from a different truth. Right, and, th and that's really just part of being uh, of loving God and, and 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 being of love is that non-judgmental acceptance, I guess you could say, right? Uh -huh. um, you know, there at the uh, East SETI Ranch, and perhaps you should remind us uh, just what East SETI stands for. You've had some remarkable contact experiences there, yeah. uh, to say the least, uh -huh. um, and. Um, one thing I'd like to clarify is, in, uh, speaking of your direct ET contact experiences, your face-to-face -face experiences, mm -hmm. have these occurred while you're in some sort of meditative state, or did they actually happen when you're in your normal, awake, you know, um, state of mind? Both. Uh, mm. Both. It's, uh, they really wanted me to focus on more of the spiritual side of things, because these beings are very spiritually and technologically advanced beings. And they're telepathic in nature, and it's much easier to communicate and have contact through those measures. The, the more physical they become, the more danger it puts us in on the ground, you know, due to other forces out there. So they, they kind of, but in the beginning, it was face to face, and it was very physical. And, and, and then I had a lot of interdimensional experiences after that with different, different groups, some fifth and sixth and seventh dimensional groups. So uh, it's it's interesting, but they they really want us to focus more on the heart and feeling and uh, develop our sacred senses, uh, clairvoyancy, clairsentience, and clairaudience and things of that nature, and uh, rise to the occasion versus them having to come down and babysit us all the time and create a big mess, you know, <laughs> when they do land because it is it does create a big mess when they do land. Which ET groups have you been in contact with? I'd say the major group are the Palladians, and uh, there's a lot of controversy around that. I know the, the Meyer group keeps saying that there are no Palladians, that he made that up, and they're really Plagiarans. But, you know, unfortunately for him, all the ancient cultures talk about the Palladians. Even the Mayans say that they got their calendar from the Palladians. And uh, if you go to um, the Philippines or talk to any of the indigenous people there, they all, you know, the Native Americans, they point to the Palladians, and they said those are our ancestors. So uh, those are the sky gods or the sky people or the star nations they refer to them as. But uh, so there's a, a long, long history, you know, in that program. But, you know, when you want to to create an exclusive and capitalize on the exclusive, you, you try to close out, you know, everything else, unfortunately. And you've also mentioned uh, the Ar uh, Arcturians, I believe. Were, th were they the uh, the feline um, based? Uh... No, those those were Syrian actually. But Syrian, they're all, okay. They're all over the place. They're they're in the motherships. They're all they're the benevolent protectors. Uh, in India, they called them Narsringa, which which means the benevolent protectors. And in Egypt, they called them Sekhmet. And and if you go to Egypt and you see the statues of uh, Sekhmet. Uh, she's smiling. She has this benevolent smile on her, and she's very loving. And it's not this foreboding uh, image at all, because these beings were very enlightened beings, and they're you know fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensional beings. And so they've been around for a long time. The the seventh dimensional beings they call them the the protectors of the gods. You know they're they're the ones that uh, kind of keep an eye on things for them. But uh, they. They come down here. They've they've been seen throughout history, and and actually the Dome of the Rock footage was a feline group that did that. 
Why why are the ET so interested in in number one us and in this particular period of time? Uh, mm-hmm. Is does it impact them somehow too? Whatever is going on here? Yeah, it does. Those are really good questions. One, the Pleiadians have more stock in the Earth than any other group, and they're the terraformers. They have did a lot of genetic tinkering here with the plants and the animals, even humans, and they set up the first. Uh, major colonies that we can remember which were uh, Atlantis Lemuria so there is other groups that came here there's an Orion, the Orion group from the Orion Council of Light was here the Andromedans were here I think some Arcturians were here there's there's a whole group of other other beings that were that were coming and going and uh, but they were the first major colonies so the because of universal law, they've had meetings and they've kind of passed the scepter of the Pleiadians. So they're the, the main group that's in charge right now because they have kind of a karmic connection and also a genetic, uh, more genetic stock here than anybody else. And so they're kind of taking the helm right now, but they're with a lot of other groups that are coming in to, to help Earth in its transition. And, and for as far as the second question, we are in this huge transitional phase right now. And where the entire Earth is ascending to the next level, and they're they're kind of caretakers and helping that process. They're birthing that process along, and they they really want to restore the planet and actually restore the consciousness here, and, and you know bring it up to fifth dimensional consciousness again, again, which it once was, you know, a long time ago. Well, speaking of that, when the I take it the Palladians first um, did the DNA manipulation here on Earth. Um, what was their intent? What was their goal with that manipulation? Well, there was, there was another group, and, and this is where it gets kind of fuzzy. I'm not exactly sure where this other group came from uh, in very, very ancient times, and people call them the Anunnaki. Uh, and they did a lot of manipulation, a lot of DNA manipulation, and they were here for different reasons. They were here because their, their planet was, was dying, and they needed to put gold into their atmosphere. Uh, my understanding about the Anunnaki is that it's nothing to fear. I mean, a race, you know, that's been snorting gold dust for 450,000 years is probably pretty enlightened by now, you know. So, so they, uh, I don't think there's anything to fear there. I think they're extremely advanced beings, and and uh, they're not really here to take anything. They they might bag some gold on their way through, but uh, you know, who knows? Yeah. But, uh, the, Dolores Cannon uh, talks about, uh, just as you brought up, two groups, uh, and that the uh, that the Anunnaki were this the second group, uh, the same people that Zechariah Sitchin uh, t- talks about in the Sumerian translations, uh, that um, kind of uh, at that time diverted the original plan and apparently wanted uh, wanted people to mine gold from them at least that's what mm-hmm. you know what De- De- Dolores's information is yeah and um so um the, well, yeah it's been going on for 600 million years that yeah. i know of yeah so, so it's you know we've had people coming and going and cataclysms and meteor strikes and pole shifts and things of that nature so uh you know our our last memories of all that happening they're not even memories, but the last stone writings and whatever else we have are, were the last the big pole shift, which was the Atlantis and Lemurian epoch, you know. Uh, we've had some other smaller shifts since then, but uh, the, the big event, you know, was the, you know, the biblical floods and all the other things happened around that time. So in any case, it appears that our our eventual goal, um, uh, uh, state will be uh, rejoining our galactic family uh, mm-hmm. Once, once we are at uh, a sufficient vibration, uh, does that sound right to you? Exactly, exactly. It's, it's so important to realize, um, you know, I the, the a lot of the star nations, well, they get a bad rap because everybody, you know, is saying they're channeling them and they're connected to them, and they are extremely advanced, loving beings, and so automatically they think they're going to be taken care of, you know. But it, it doesn't work that way. They go, oh, they're going to beam me up, and they're going to. I'll max out my credit cards, and I don't have to take responsibility for anything here, and and uh, and so it just doesn't work that way, uh, because that would be an extreme disempowerment and interfering with your sole purpose and things like that. So, so it's real important that that we need to rise to the occasion. We need to do our work here uh, as as the hands and feet of the ground crew, 
and uh, and they they're helping us. They're energetically helping us through consciousness and the energy grids and things like that, and and kind of watching over us and inspiring us. They're working more on those levels, but uh, we need to do the work down here. And uh, and they're working with a lot of people right now to to help change, you know, change the planet around. So, you know, it, it's going to get real interesting because. No matter what happens, it's going to happen. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, it can't be stopped. The shift can't be stopped. It's just, are we going to do it gracefully and uh, flow with these changes and rise to the occasion? Or, or are we going to fight and resist it and, uh, and then have that experience, have the reactions from that experience? Well, for those that are open to the Ascension experience, the shift, how do you think that they will experience that? Um, you know, would it be merely like uh, going to sleep and waking up someplace new or well, what is your impression boy i'm not i think again uh you know my experience when i had my near-death experience i imagine that would be similar to an ascension experience and uh and but i think you're going to send levels you don't have to go all the way back to the source but you just shift into the next level, and, and that happens here on a regular basis. Like I was saying, we have people phasing out, and I'll walk up to people after a deep meditation, and there'll be like eight or nine people in the field. I'll walk right up to them, and they're looking at me, and they don't even see me. And I say, hey, how's it going? And all of a sudden, they all jump out of their shoes, you know? And so although I'm out of just phased out a little bit to where they're not aware of me being there, I'm fully aware of them. And but I'm actually functioning on on a different level, and I'm fully aware of them. Uh, it's kind of funny watching that when it when it happens. But uh, and that's kind of the way I see it. You know, a lot of people may not even know. They might fall asleep or do a long meditation, or they get up to that critical mass point and just do the shift and end up staying there. And and you know, there are I believe there's you know many worlds all around us. You know, you've got all the because on the vortex here, the the world the veils collapse here at the vortex and so it's very easy to experience you know the nature kingdom the ascended masters the angelic kingdom or the ultra dimensionals it's because the energies here are so high it's very easy to to access those and and everybody's different you know some people are really on a soul level they're really connected to the nature kingdom the nature spirits you know some people are connected to the ascended masters and some people are connected to the off-worlders but but when we get the big picture we realize it's all connected and 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 humanity is the one that's disconnected you know yeah. you know unfortunately most of humanity doesn't understand that you know once the ascension event occurs it's it's kind of my personal uh, impression that it's not necessarily that it's you know all rest and relaxation and rejuvenation you know that there's actually going to be i don't want to use the term jobs but there's going to be mm -hmm. a a activities and oh, yeah. one and one of them that I, I think is very important is um continuing uh spiritual and perhaps even practical education um and uh what I'm kind of thinking about is, you know, if there might be a, a true campus of higher learning, if you will, or m maybe mm -hmm. many, many of those, much like the East SETI Ranch. Do you see that kind of education, that kind of spiritual development continuing past this, the Ascension event? Uh, definitely. I think, you know, people may ascend into the fourth dimension or even the fifth dimension, you know, but there's quite a few dimensions beyond that. And I know a lot of people are actually going to school, and some people remember, and some people don't remember. Remember, because when they go to sleep, they're actually out of body, and they're, and you know, they'll come back and they're, God, I was working last night. I'm tired. You know, I don't know why. And they'll remember. You know, they might have been in the astral level or, or helping other people or, or going to school or things like that. So a lot of that's already going on. We're just not aware of it. So James, is there anything coming up that that you'd uh, that you'd like to promote? Uh, yeah, we've got Neil Kramer coming up this August. Uh, people can shoot us an email, you know, towards the end of August if they want to see that. We're in the process of working on that. Um, we've just finished a conference here, and we have some amazing DVDs. You know, we had Anelia Benz here and Tian Jia, who teaches Tian Gong. She's a, a master teacher from from the East, uh, was here. Uh, gave some just incredible initiation energy and, and did some workshops. Uh, Neil Kramer was here. We have him on, on DVD. Myself, I gave a presentation and talked about 
you know, all the different orbs and other dimensions and, and showed the craft all over the world appearing. Um, oh, God. Um, Jason Verbelli was here talking about fearless energy technology. Uh, John Kelly was here. He does reverse speech, but he's been the main investigator out here in the field every night filming these ships. And we have amazing footage on the ESETI Stargate YouTube page. So if you just go to YouTube and type in ESETI Stargate, you can see a lot of the footage. And this is all recent footage on there. So uh, that's one. Um, I know I'm forgetting a couple people. I should have had the list in front of me. I didn't think of it. But uh, you can go to the website and check it out. You can go to eSETI.org or send us an email uh, if you're if you're interested. The, the, we just finished rendering the DVDs, so they should be ready and and on the, you know on the shelves in probably just a couple days. But uh, oh boy, I'm trying to. Oh, Brooks Agnew was was here also, and he he did a talk, uh, and we did a talk about uh, sovereign law. You know, and, and we had a guy here. For, so we covered the whole gamut, you know, up to the sovereignty movement, to UFOs, to uh, uh, the high spiritual teachings. You know, we, we had a really nice, nice balanced group of people here. So uh, it was it was quite a conference. And uh, oh, Renato Lingato was here, too, oh. as well. So, you know, he gave a really good dissertation. And I understand that people can uh, sign up to visit the ranch in between these conferences, that you're open to having uh, guests who can experience some of these uh, ET flybys for themselves. Yes, we usually have a pretty good group out here. And if people call us and uh, or shoot us an email, uh, you can just go to the website at eSETI.org and shoot us an email. Uh, we can set up an appointment. We, we had to go kind of private. Uh, mainly because of a lot of problems with the county and everything. Uh, so, so now we, you know, people call or make an arrangement, and so it's a private agreement. And we had to start doing things that way just because of some of the heat. You know, we would like to close our doors. Mm. But uh, it's been insane. We've had this is my uh, sixth court appearance coming up on the twentieth, and we've had three judges dismissed, two prosecuting attorneys are gone. Uh, you know, it, and they just keep trying. They they keep trying over and over, and they have no case or no no bat, no reason whatsoever to do what they're doing. But it's just you know, it's just harassment and and problems of that nature. So, uh, you know, it, it it's just unbelievable what's going on. I, you know, I'm at a point now where I'm just done. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying. You know, 10 strikes and you're out, you know, come on, can't keep bringing this up to the plate. You know, it, eventually you have to realize it's, it's over, but uh, we'll see where that goes. Well, the information, uh, thanks to people such as yourself, is out there no matter what they do. And, and, I, and, oh, yeah. and I think people are, are waking up to the opportunity. Oh, we had like probably 100,000 people doing an intention experiment to get it dismissed. So <laughs> so you can imagine the whole courthouse was full of people. So people are just not putting it up with the nonsense anymore and they're just saying this is ridiculous, you know. So so it's it's just crazy stuff that's going on, but it's it's to be expected, you know. It's there's an old saying, you know, the closer you get to the light, the more the demons are going to rear their ugly heads and and uh, and that just comes with the territory and I I kind of I was surprised I got away with things as long as I did without having more flack, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know. Well, so. James, I want to thank you again for being so generous with your time and sharing your insights and experiences uh, with our audience. As, as always, we invite our viewers to leave comments, questions, guest recommendations uh, on the Soul Adventure TV website or on Facebook or YouTube. And please feel free to share this video because this information, as we were just talking about, is meant for everyone. So until next time, this is Steve Crow, your host, wishing you an enlightened, fulfilling soul adventure. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, James. Bye.